Okay, so the topic of this video is going to be chemical energy and a molecule called adenosine triphosphate, ATP. You know, here's a, a, a structural drawing of an ATP molecule, and here's kind of a more three-dimensional realistic diagram of an ATP molecule. So what we're going to do is we're going to learn about this molecule called ATP. Let's get started. All right, as we discuss chemical energy and ATP, our food that we eat will be you will, will supply the glucose and the lipids that are required to build ATP molecules. So, you know, in the picture, we have a plate of pasta here. You know, pasta is high in carbohydrates and glucose is a carbohydrate. Well, there's also lipids in the foods that we eat. And so glucose from our foods and lipids from our foods are going to be used to build ATP molecules, adenosine triphosphate. And so energy for our cells to do work will be stored in the bonds of an ATP molecule. So here's a molecule of ATP, and particularly you can see the three phosphates. Remember, it's called triphosphate. You can see the three phosphates on the left of this diagram. That's typically where the energy for cells to do work is going to be stored, in between those bonds holding the phosphates together. And so if we look at this more simplistic diagram right here, we can see adenosine triphosphate. The blue P's, there's three phosphate, three P's stuck together. And the, my notes say that energy is released when that third phosphate is broken off. And so that third, the, the bond that holds the second to the third phosphate together, the bond that holds the second P to the third P, that bond is fairly unstable and it's easily broken. And watch this, when that third phosphate is broken, energy is released. Energy, usually in the form of heat, is released and that heat will kind of stimulate cells to, to do various functions. And notice what's left over. You have the broken remains of ATP left over. And when you have the a uh, when you have the adenosine diphosphate, I hope you see why it's called diphosphate. Di is a prefix that means two. So the molecule on the left that's left over, it's called adenosine diphosphate. And there's that broken off phosphate on the right still. Okay, so now that that third phosphate has been broken off, ATP can actually be recreated. So notice you have adenosine diphosphate, ADP on the left, and that broken phosphate on the right. Well, with the addition of energy from the food that we eat and various enzymes, that broken phosphate can be reattached to recreate ATP. This way our cell can have more ATP for more energy. So if we again take a look at an ATP molecule here, well, when that third phosphor, uh, phosphate is broken off, that's going to release energy for our cells to do work. And then what you're left over with are the broken pieces. You have the ADP and that broken phosphate. Well, with energy from the food that we eat, that broken phosphate can be reattached to ADP to recreate ATP. Now, this is actually called the ADP, ATP cycle, and this process continues over and over from, from birth until death. Okay, when we look at the process of digestion, you know, digestion, the, think about the purpose of digestion. It's simply break the food that we've eaten into usable molecules. Once the food that we've eaten has been broken down into usable molecules, those usable molecules will hopefully uh, help create ATP. And so here's a hamburger. Pretend you've just eaten this hamburger for lunch. If we zoom into the hamburger, you know, we can see that, you know, there's complex sugars inside of hamburgers. And a complex sugar is, again, made up from smaller, simple sugars. A complex sugar, you might remember, is actually called a polysaccharide. And the simple sugars, if you recall, are called monosaccharides. Well, through the digestion, that complex sugar will get broken down into its simple sugar components. Well, let's just focus on one simple sugar. So if we just focus on one simple sugar, through the, uh, through the breakdown of this one simple sugar, for instance, glucose, glucose is a simple sugar. Through the breakdown of glucose, ATP is going to be created. Now, higher calorie foods will produce more ATP molecules because higher calorie foods have more of those glucoses in them. And so, of course, the more glucose there is, the more ATP will be created. 
Now, when we look at, here's a diagram of glucose. You know, one molecule of glucose through a process that we're going to learn later on this chapter called cellular respiration, one glucose molecule will actually be used to make up to 36 ATP molecules. And it's even more when you look at a lipid. Here's a triglyceride. A lipid, remember triglycerides, are three fatty acids connected to a glycerol head. And so one uh, triglyceride can actually yield up to 146 ATP molecules. So you see we get a lot more ATP from fats. Now that doesn't mean we go out and eat a lot, a lot, a lot of fats to make more and more and more ATP because there's only so much ATP we can use in a day. If our body produces more ATP than can be used, of course, the energy will be stored and stored in the form of fat. Now what about proteins? You know, proteins are common in the foods that we eat, uh, but notice how, how the, you know, the proteins are not usually digested to build ATP. When you look at a protein, here's a picture of, again of a chain of amino acids, which is what proteins are made from. When you look at a picture like this, when proteins are broken down, those amino acids are usually going to be used for other processes. So those amino acids are, have, have to be used elsewhere. So uh, the ATP typically comes from the carbohydrates in, glu uh, in glucose that we eat and from the lipids that we eat. So to kind of wrap up this video here, when we look at the energy on Earth, it really starts with the sun. So most life on Earth relies directly or indirectly on the sun. I do say most because there is this peculiar group of creatures in the deepest, bottomest parts of the ocean. We'll get to those in a moment. But most life relies either directly or indirectly on the sun. You know, I thought these were just very pretty images right here. Various images of our sun taken from uh, NASA satellites. Different light filters on them showing the different kinds of energy that the sun can give off. Well, when we look at directly, organisms that directly rely on, on the sun for energy would be autotrophs, such as plants. You know, plants are not the only autotrophs, but they're the most common one. Plants obtain energy directly from the sun by doing photosynthesis. So do uh, some cyanobacteria, there's some photosynthetic bacteria. So do algae. These are things that directly get their energy from the sun. Indirectly, let's not forget that, you know, consumers, heterotrophs, such as this animal, this rabbit here. You know, rabbits are herbivores and, and they eat plants and, and then plants feed directly on sunlight. So the rabbit doesn't get energy directly from the sun. The rabbit gets energy directly from the plant. The plant gets energy directly from the sun. Let's not forget the meat eaters out there, such as the wolf. You know, the wolves get energy indirectly from the sun. Wolves get their energy directly from rabbits or some other small, you know, a, a rodent perhaps, a mouse or something, or a rat. So wolves will get their energy directly from eating some kind of smaller animal, which that smaller animal, before it was caught by the wolf, you know, fed on a plant, which got its energy directly from the sun. So like my notes say, most life relies on the sun directly or indirectly, but the exceptions would be the chemotrophs. You know, here's a picture of an underwater hydrothermal vent, and you can see some black smoke billowing out of this hydrothermal vent, yeah, a little crack in the crust. And so all this smoke is coming out from the mantle of the earth. And there are organisms down there called chemotrophs. Well, first of all, in that black smoke, there are there's a gas called sulfides that are being released in into the, the ocean water. There are bacteria down there called chemotrophs that will feed on those sulfides. So there's a unique group of bacteria that will feed on those sulfides in order to make their ATP. And this is a process called chemosynthesis. And the bacteria that do chemosynthesis are called chemotrophs. But even though this is a rare exception, I do want to stress the top of the notes. Most life on Earth relies directly or indirectly on the sun to make their energy. So there you go. Uh, you can pause this video and you know try to answer these questions if you're in my biology class. Put your answers on a separate sheet of paper. I'd, I'd love to check your answers before school or after school for accuracy. Good luck.